Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Hello and welcome into episode 56 of the Leaning into Leadership podcast. From tracking criminals and terrorists on the dark web to creating marketplaces and new authentic systems, my guest on the show today, Mark Hirschberg, has spent his career launching and developing new ventures at startups and Fortune 500s and in academia with over a dozen patents to his name. He helped to start the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, dubbed MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where he teaches at annually. He is also the author of The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You, and the creator of the Brain Bump app. Now, before we get to the interview with Mark, I want to share some exciting news with you. I teased this a little bit last week in the blog and then actually shared something in a full blog post right after that. But recently, I've updated and decided to re-release my book, Road to Awesome. Now, so many of you helped to make Road to Awesome empower, lead, change the game, here forevermore, known as the first edition, a bestseller in July of 2020. And now we're ready to release the second edition. The second edition will be titled Road to Awesome, The Journey of a Leader. I've made some big updates to this book And I'm super excited to see this thing drop right here at the beginning of February. Let me share with you just a couple of the changes that you're going to see in this particular edition of the book. In the first edition of the book, I talked about the six things that I thought were most important in school leadership. This edition still has six key areas, but there are two new focuses. Number one is instructional leadership. You know, it's so important for school leaders to be an integral part of the instructional program. And leaders really need to be focused on their presence in their classrooms, increasing student engagement, and leading for positive student outcomes. In this edition of the book, I talk about that in depth, giving you some stories, some insight, and some ideas of how to make that happen, to allow yourself to be the instructional leader that you know you want to be. The second area is being the champion. You know, we're in a time right now when teacher turnover is insanely high. For that matter, so is leadership turnover. And leaders are faced with so many different pressures from the outside. Being the the champion of your school is a key, folks. And some of that means you're going to focus on building culture. And some of it means you're going to focus on mentoring and coaching everyone to greatness. Some of it means you're going to defend against all those outside threats and pressures. And some of it just simply means you're going to be the champion of the story. Another big addition to this book are the three core beliefs of The Road to Awesome that I've really honed and discovered and found to be so true over the last couple of years, speaking at conferences and in schools and in so many other ways about the book. Those three core beliefs are number one, we focus on how we show up by letting go of the things we can't control and focusing on what we can control. Number two is we rise by lifting others. We've all been around those people who want to push others down or who want to try to make themselves seem bigger than everyone else. Nah, on the road to awesome, we rise by lifting others. We're the ones who reach a hand down and lift people up. And number three, and folks, this one is so huge, and this is a big driver behind this podcast too. We change the world one conversation at a time. Road to awesome, the journey of a leader coming very soon. I believe next week when we're on the podcast here, we're going to be talking about exactly where you can go and get that book, where you can get your hands on that book, and you can get that thing ordered right away. So exciting news from us here at Road to Awesome. Super excited about the book. Super excited about this conversation with Mark Hirschberg. So let's go right to it. Enjoy the conversation, and I'll see you on the other side. All right. Mark, welcome in to the Leading into Leadership podcast. I'm super pumped to have this conversation with you today. How's everything going with you? Going great. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just really quick um, share with with my listeners who you are, where you're coming from, and a little bit about you, and then we're going to dive right into this conversation. I have a very interesting background with a dual career. 
So I started out back in the 90s, I graduated from MIT with a whole bunch of STEM degrees, and I started out as a software engineer in the dot-com era. Early on, I realized that I wanted to become a CTO, a chief technology officer. And so I set my sights on that, realizing that to be a CTO, it wasn't just about being the best engineer. Yeah, I had to be good at that. But there were all these other skills, leadership, team building, communications, negotiating, all these skills that I needed, but no one ever taught me. And I began to develop those skills in myself. Now, as I was doing so, I realized these skills are not just for executives. They are for everyone in the company, people at all levels. So I began to upskill my entire team. And as I was doing that, MIT had done some surveys of companies who said, these are the skills we want to see not just in your students, not just in college grads, but in general, we want to see these skills in our employees and we can't find them either. Can you do something about this? So MIT put together a program referred to as now the Career Success Accelerator. And when I heard about it, I said, well, I've developed some content, please, you're welcome to use it. I thought it'd be one and done. But instead, MIT said, why don't you help us develop more content? And hey, why don't you help us teach it? That was a little over 20 years ago. So I've had my career. I became a CTO. In fact, I'm a CTPO, Chief Technology Product Officer. And I've built a bunch of startups. I've helped some Fortune 500s play startup. And I've had that career. But in parallel, I've been teaching at MIT's Career Success Accelerator for 20 plus years, and then launched the book, the app, and the speaking, and other things I do with that secondary career that I do in parallel. That's just awesome. And, and we're, we're going to get to a lot of those things that you just talked about the book and, uh, and the, and the app and, and that type of stuff. But, but I want to go right at something, uh, that you said, and, and you and I actually talked about this, uh, in our pre-meeting. Um, but you're talking about career skills and teaching career skills at MIT, which is probably not something most people would put those two together. Right. Um, I'm a big advocate for for career education uh, types of skills. Um, I, I think I shared with you, you know, my background with uh, development of career academies and some of those types of things. But I'll ask you the same question I asked you when when we met the previous time: Why do we need to teach career skills at the collegiate level? Because they're not taught at any level, unfortunately. Think back to a skill like networking. Now, I first heard about networking probably when I was a kid from my parents who said networking is important. You probably heard it as well when you were a kid and your parents said networking is important and your teachers in junior high and high school said networking is important. Your professors said networking is important. When did anyone actually teach you how to network? Never. Everyone keeps telling us it's important <laughs> but they don't right. stop to teach us. In fact, most of us have had more formal training in how to tie our shoes, because I remember my parents saying with me, teaching me how to tie our shoes. We've had more training in how to tie our shoes than how to network. And this is insane. People tell us these skills are important, but for various historical reasons, they're not actually taught. I think that's fascinating. I, I want to talk about more of those skills, but I, I want to go a little bit more with networking. Uh, just as you were talking, it made me think just a little bit. You, you know, you mentioned, you know, when we were younger, being you know told that networking was important, but nobody ever taught us. Networking today in 2022 or 2023, depending on when you're listening to this episode, that's not the same thing in essence, or it's done differently than maybe it was in. 1989 or 1996 or something like that. Can, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like when you're teaching networking to today's, you know, uh, college level or, or master's level students and, and how it differs from maybe what it was when we were, you know, considerably younger? I'm actually going to argue that it is, it is exactly the same, but most people do the wrong thing and that wrong thing has changed over time. So let's first think about the wrong thing. So many people, they think of networking as, oh, there's this great guy in my company who's such a good networker. We go into a conference, big room of people, 
And he walks off an hour later, he comes back and he's got 15 business cards. Wow, he's a master networker. Or do you see her LinkedIn profile? She has 2,000 connections. She is so networked. But here's the question. Right. Does connecting to 2,000 people on LinkedIn mean you're actually in their network? Saying some random person you connected to on LinkedIn is in your network, that's like saying, last night I went on Tinder. I swiped right on this girl. She swiped right on me. <laughs> We're in a relationship. We're done. We're practically married. You told me I was insane if I told you that. You're and right. yet we think if we do it on LinkedIn, oh, we're networked with each other. Now, with this Tinder example, what we know is when you both swipe right, you're not in a relationship. You've expressed some initial interest, but now you have to build the relationship. We call that dating. And over time, you build the relationship and it gets more serious and leads to something down the road. And maybe marriage, maybe we break up. I'm still friends with some of my exes. When we meet someone at this event and get their business card, or we connect with them on LinkedIn, that's the start. But we have to build that relationship. We don't call it dating, but it's the same idea that we get to know each other. We build trust. We build the relationship. Consider the following. If you need to move next week, you got to pack up your house. You got to go move. Who do you ask? Do you ask the guys you met in the bar last night? Hey, it was great hanging out with you. Had a few drinks. Fantastic. Why don't you come over to my place next weekend and you're going to spend the afternoon helping me pack up and load up the truck. And say, yeah, no, I'll see you for another beer, but I ain't doing that. Right. But you can yeah. call your best friend from high school. You can call people you've known for years where you've built that relationship and say, hey, I need a favor. And that's what networking is. Networking is building relationships. So that has not changed. The nature of building relationships isn't different. Now, how we build relationships has changed. In fact, this is one of perhaps the positives of the pandemic. Many negatives, of course. I'd still rather we didn't have it. But if yeah. I had five years ago, if we're in the same city, I could say, hey, let's meet for coffee. Okay, great. But if we're not in the same city and I said to you five years ago, hey, let's jump on this video call and have a virtual coffee, <laughs> you'd look at me like my head's not on straight. Like, what are you talking about? And so we lost touch with people who were not geographically close. But now it's normal to say, hey, let's jump on a video call. Let's catch up. And that allows us to continue to build the relationships with people who are not local to us. And that has been a positive for how we network. But the very nature, that relationship building remains the same. I love that you went there too, because, you know, it, to me, everything we do is based on relationships. And, you know, I think a lot of times people lose sight of that with, with networking, that it isn't just about the number of connections you have on Twitter or LinkedIn or, or whatever the case may be, um, or even how many people, you know, for, for entrepreneurs, how many people you have in your email list. I mean, it's, it's about building and nurturing that relationship. I, I, I think that's awesome. So let, let's go a little further then with, with those career skills. And, you know, uh, not all, but a bulk of my audience are in the education space. And in, in, in the education space, we have taken that, that kind of cluster of skills and called them anything from career ready skills, 21st century skills, soft skills. I mean, you name it. It's got all kinds of different names for it. And not everybody necessarily agrees on what all those specific skills are. But I think there are definitely a handful of ones that we would all agree these are essential. Networking be an example. Um, what might be three or four of those other skills that are just so essential right now, no matter what label you want to put on them. Let me give you the 10 that I put in the book. And these 10 came from looking at surveys done by MIT, by other universities, online surveys from big corporations who focus on HR. Consistently, we saw the same pattern. And you're right, you can call them six skills or 16, depending on how you draw the line and what you call them. But what I saw was a consistent pattern. So 10 skills, I bucket them into three categories. So chapter one, section one of the book has three chapters. First is career plans. How to actually create and execute a career plan. 
because people need to know where they're trying to go instead of just wandering around and hoping they get there. Chapter two, I call it working effectively. And these are skills like understanding corporate culture, dealing with corporate politics, understanding how you add value. So it's not the mechanics of your job, but understanding the context of your job. Chapter three is interviewing. Now here, there's two parts to it. Most people focus on, here's how as a candidate to interview. Here's how as a candidate, you know, I know how to answer this question. But for many of us, we interview other people. We hire our peers, we hire our subordinates, and there's been little or no interviewing training. And that's insane. So we need to teach people how to interview. We don't let people get into a car. If you think about it, we say like, oh, you've seen me drive. You get the steering wheel, the brake pedal. Great. You know what to do. Go drive. <laughs> we would never do that. And yet we do that with their interviews. Well, you've been interviewed before. So here you go. Go interview some of our future hires. Right. So that's first section. Second section, leadership and management. I have a chapter on leadership. And then management, I break into the people side of management. And then another chapter on the process side of management. The final section, interpersonal dynamics. And this is communications, networking, negotiating, and ethics. Ethics, unfortunately, is sometimes off of these lists, or if they're put on, it's more lip service. They put, oh, yeah, yeah, ethics too. And that's usually the one people focus on least, but I think it's equally important, maybe even more so, especially given the world today. So those are the 10 skills that I see most often that are most common that pretty much everyone agrees on. How do you teach ethics? I mean, how, how do you like intentionally teach ethics? Ethics is, I think, best done through case studies. Now, all these skills, by the way, we can talk about how to teach it. It's not sit here and memorize it. It's not like right. when, when you teach, for example, math, you say, here's a number of sides in a triangle. Or here's a quadratic equation. Memorize it. There's no, here's the formula for ethics. It's not that easy. So right. looking at cases. But I would say going further, let's actually think of fire drills. If you had never had a fire drill and the fire alarm goes off, what are you likely to do? You're, oh my God, fire, or you're gonna run. But all of us, since we were little kids, have been trained in schools, even some of my offices, we do fire drills. And I've been buildings where the alarm's gone off, no one's racing for the exits, no one's shoving other people out of their way, like, yep, we've done this before. Don't use the elevators, walk calmly and quickly, stairwell and we exit the building. We've been trained how to do it. When you think about ethics, in most cases, we know right and wrong. There may be some fuzzy cases, but very often, most of the issues you see, people really know where they are, which side of the line they're at. But they cross it because usually there's pressure. If someone says, oh, you know, I can't make payroll right now. Well, what if I borrow some money from this account and do this and it will just all work out and then no one will know. And I'm not trying to be bad, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross a line here. And that's why we see there's some pressure. If we can give people training that even under pressure, even when that alarm is going off, we can say, remember your training, remember where the lines are, remember, don't take the elevators. We're more likely to do the right thing. Hey leaders, let me tell you a story. It's the story of my first year as a high school principal. I will tell you, I was exhausted, I was overwhelmed, and I lived my life breathing through a snorkel because my head was so far underwater and I didn't think there was a way out. I mean, I was a mess. The 40 feet that it was to move from my assistant principal office down to the principal's office might as well have been a 400 mile trek. I was just absolutely putting in crazy hours. I was trying to do it all, like trying to answer everybody's question thinking I always had to be the smartest one in the room and I had to solve everybody's problems. We're talking severe super man syndrome here, folks. Every day was fire after fire and all I accomplished was putting out fires. Forget about leading, I was simply trying to survive. Now, after working with a leadership coach, I really was able to get things figured out, get my head from being a firefighter actually being a leader but it took work 
and I discovered some things that really mattered. And that's why I've created Walk in Your Purpose Five Mindsets to Level Up Your Leadership, a free ebook that you can have today at no cost. Just go to walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook to download your free copy. Again, that's walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook. It's time for you to walk in your purpose, to find joy in your job, and to be the leader you always knew that you could be. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. So so you've kind of mentioned it already a a little bit with the book. How how did the process play out for you with with actually developing the book? I mean, you, you mentioned MIT coming and, and and developing this process and you getting involved in this. Where along the way did the book come into play? For many years, I encouraged MIT to create content based on the course. And the reason I say this, the way we teach the course is not – People like me stand up and lecture at the students. It's very hands-on, very interactive, which is the right way to teach this, but our students don't take a lot of notes. And then of course, like most students, two minutes after the class is over, they forget 90% of it. I said, oh, that's not good. I wanna help them remember this for later when they need it. We should write up some notes. And MIT pioneered online courseware. We were, I believe, the first university to take our content, put online, give away for free, said, well, let's do it with this content. For various reasons, we weren't able to do that. And while I was traveling a lot for work, I had a lot of downtime on planes. I get some work done on them, but then I just had downtime sitting on a plane or sitting in a hotel room. I thought, well, let me put together some content. I started out writing up the content for the students and summarizing and doing things. I really thought I'd be writing a 20-page book. But 20 pages became 40, became 80. And once it passed 100, I said, okay, I think this is a book. And you know what? This should not just be for students. It certainly isn't just for engineers and scientists. It was broad to begin with. But I said, let me just make this even broader so it's not just written for students. It's written universally, no matter where you are in your career, if you want to get better at leadership, at networking, at negotiating, this book can help you. This gets to the skills. And I've had the fortune, the good fortune, that for 20 years, I've been teaching with these wonderful professors. So we've got this great research behind what we teach and 20 years of experience to know how to teach it. One of the most common pieces of feedback I get, someone says, I was reading your book, I was on a page, I had a question. As soon as I turned the page, you answered it. And it's not that I'm psychic. I've just taught this for so many years. I know exactly right. what comes next. 90% of the people, this is their question. Let me address that. So it really, just trying to help the students led to a book that could really be used by anyone. So as I was researching the book, um, I, you know, I found myself thinking, you know, back to, you know, both my time as a high school principal and also my time as a superintendent and how, you know, I was always looking for opportunities to grow my team and to help them continue to to improve and, and to, you know, put more, you know, put more, you know, tools on their tool belt. And sometimes, you know, you would find these trainings that, you know, we got all, you know, we all have to load up in an airplane and, you know, and, and go. Um, we took our entire team once for a training on, you know, like deep investigation skills, you know, do, you know, investigations around, you know, employee, you know, employee infractions and, and those types of things. But what I what I enjoyed and what I what I saw when I was when I was doing the research here was there are there are some resources within the book that and, and some resources available separate that if if I'm leading my resource or my my leadership team, there's there's actually some human resources types of tools that allow me to kind of build something myself. Can can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that there are so many other educational leaders out there right now that want to be able to help build these skills within their team, but they're 
they're strapped for time and they're and in some cases strapped for money and they can't send a group of you know a group of leaders to MIT to to take your course. If you think about the training you did with your staff, you said we're going to take everyone for a couple days, do this intensive yeah. training, and you come back. Now let's think about another group you train at your school, your sports teams. Let's take your high school football team. Imagine if your coach said, listen, I'm going to take the team first weekend in September. I'm going to take them away for the weekend. We're going to have an intensive football training camp. Come back. Okay. No more practice. We're done. They have their training. They're ready to play right. the season. That would be insane. Of course, you're not done. Great. You had that weekend. Fantastic. That's a good start. But you need to keep practicing. And that's especially true because these skills, again, it's not like I memorized the formula in chemistry, done. I don't have to memorize again. I know it. When it comes to leadership, there's no formula. There's no three things to always do for communications. It's subtle. It's situation dependent. We can always grow and learn. So we want to develop these skills differently. And in fact, you can do it in-house. So here's how you can create an in-house training program at little or no cost whatsoever. What you want to do is create peer learning groups. So create groups. I recommend groups of about six to eight people. And by the way, all of this, as you mentioned, it's free on my website. You can just download it. I don't even ask for your email. So everything I'm about to explain, you can download and get all the details. Create little groups, typically about six to eight people, but there's ways to do larger groups if you choose. You take those groups and you get them some content. Yes, you can use my book and it might be, we're going to focus on pages 10 to 20 for this next cycle. If you don't want to use my book, use a different book out there. Use some articles. Use a great podcast like this one where you listen to some episode. Doesn't matter where it comes from. Get some source content. Everyone reads it or listens to it. And then you begin that discussion. It's in that discussion where we talk about leadership and you share what you thought and I share what I thought. So, oh, you know, Darren, I, that's interesting how you thought about it. I would not have thought about it that way. You've helped me understand and expand my thinking. Even if I say, you know, the way you lead, that doesn't suit me. That's okay. But now I see other people lead differently and that's helpful when I relate to other leaders. So first we're going to just learn, and expand our understanding. But there's a whole bunch of other advantages that we get by doing this. So in addition to upskilling our employees, we are fostering internal networks. How often do people within companies, I suspect the same is true in our schools, they know the other teachers and the math and science teachers hang out with each other, but maybe not with the language teachers who hang out with each other. Is that true in high yeah, school? you hit that on the head. Oh, man, you hit yep. that on the head right there. Yeah. Same, same thing in companies. You know, the engineers hang out with each other and the marketing people with each other. So you want to get people from the different groups to come together and talk. So you're fostering those internal relationships. That's really important. You're increasing engagement because we know people are saying, I'm not just doing this for the paycheck. I want a company that and school as well that not just pays me well, but cares about me, cares about my development. And this way you're giving them regular development. This is happening. You have them get together an hour a month, an hour every other week. And now they're getting regular engagement with content. They feel like they're growing. Remember as well, you never know when you need to stand up as a leader, when this communication technique applies. And that's why we can't do this one and done. Well, I learned it back in September. That was months ago. Do I remember it today? They're constantly being reminded and then the last thing is you're creating a common language. So for example, in business, there's a very famous book called Good to Great. And they talk about the hedgehog model. And if your whole team has read it, I can say to a teammate, hey, for this problem, let's really apply the hedgehog model to it. And you'd say, oh, yes, of course, I know exactly what you mean. I don't have to explain it to you because we've built that framework, we've built that language. So when the whole team engages with some content, you have the same stories, the same models, the same references to really improve communication and dialogue. So all of this, increased engagement, better internal networks, upskilling, and common language, all of which you get for free. Well, that's perfect right there. 
mean, that's that would have been the exact resource I was looking for. Um, you know, I, mean, I spent a lot of time, you know, scouring for, you know, different case studies or, you know, I mean, even just like buying books on leadership case studies just so I could use those to help grow my team. So knowing that those resources are out there, I think are fantastic for people. And just to be able to follow that simple model of, you know, get together, you know, one hour a month or, or a couple of times a month or whatever the case may be, whenever, whenever your leadership team meetings are, this is something that I've always felt very strongly about. And, and early on in my leadership career, we would have those, you know, twice a month meetings where the entire district leadership team would come together, but we didn't do anything to try and grow ourselves professionally. It was just sit and get informational type of stuff. And and so I think the more leaders are willing to take on these types of opportunities and continue to grow the leader's that they have. I mean, the, the, the career toolkit, uh, what, what I'm hearing you say without actually using the words is the career toolkit is not just for, you know, uh, our high school students to prepare them to be career ready or for, for people coming out of uh, the collegiate level, whether it's MIT or the University of Wyoming, where mm -hmm. I went or whatever, to be career ready. It's an ongoing process, correct? It absolutely is. Because ask yourself, However, wherever you are in your career, are you saying, hey, I'm a good enough leader. I don't have to worry about getting better. Oh, my network, it's good enough. I don't need to get better at it. Every one of these skills, all of us, and myself included, I wrote the book, but certainly true for me, we can all get better at each and every one of these skills. And in doing so, it improves our success. It improves our outcomes in our careers, in our life. So we can all always stand to get a little better. And this, by the way, is why I called it the career toolkit, because this is not a book where you say, well, I read the book, done. So first, you don't have to read it cover to cover. 10 chapters, 10 skills, pick up the hammer when you need a hammer, pick up the screwdriver when you need that. You can jump into any chapter when you're ready to tackle that chapter. You can start right with chapter eight, networking, skip the first seven. But you can also, after you've done it for a while, come back to it later. And each chapter we have not only actionable things you can do, but next steps to go further in the skill. So this is something you can use throughout because you're always trying to get better. So going with that just a little bit further, one of the things that, that I was hearing you talk about there was just that whole process of continuing to get better. And you didn't just write the Career Toolkit book now you've developed an app that can give us regular, like day-to-day -day reminders, uh, the Brain Bump app, which by the way, I have downloaded it. I've been using it. I get two or three alerts every single day that just bring some great content my way. Talk about that a little bit, because here we are again with another opportunity for us to continue to grow and get better as leaders and as human beings. One of the things I realized when I did my book, I said, well, this is great, but how often do we read a book and then we forget it all two weeks later? With the case of our students, we know they will intentionally learn it up until the test. As soon as the final's over in the class, I swear the information falls out of their ears right as they're walking out of the room. And that was true for me as well. The problem comes from as well, not only do we have trouble remembering, but even when we do, where we read information isn't where we need information. So let's think about that. In my book, I have a chapter on networking. Where do you read that? Sitting on your couch. Where do you need that? It's not at home. You've already met your spouse and your dog. You need it <laughs> two months from now as you're walking into the conference. So there might be first just a just in time, boy, I want those tips right before I walk into the conference rooms. We need the information in a certain context. So it wouldn't be great if I could have it. You're not going to carry my book. Even if you have the PDF or the Kindle version, you're not going to, oh, let me skim through it and try to find my notes. We need a different tool for that. So that's the just in time access. But then there's also, as educators, you know better than most, space repetition is the most proven technique, the best technique for remembering. Our students will do it because we're gonna grade them on it. And what do they do? Well, they make flashcards. But we don't make flashcards on the books we read. If we did, it would be easier to remember. So the book works, excuse me, the app works 
like a cross between a flashcard app, a daily affirmation, and a book summary app. So it takes the key ideas from the book, blog, podcast, class, or talk. We have all that content, an ever-growing set from new people who put their content on the app. That goes in, you add the content you want. It's like a companion to the book or the podcast. We don't require that you buy it. We just, if you want, you can download it. It's all free. And when you add it, you can either get those tips just in time. If you're about to go into a conference, use my book, pull up those networking tips. Everything is tagged. So you can go right to the networking tag tips or right to the leadership tag tips, pull it up and you get those tips just as you need it. Or as you mentioned, you can set it so that each day you get a daily reminder. It's like a flashcard app except you don't even need to open the app. It will just push something to you when you ask for it. We do not send you notifications you didn't want. I know how annoying it is to things always pop up. You set the time and you set the type. So you might say, I want a leadership tip at 7.30 each morning, right as I walk into my office, I wanna just have that at the top of mind. And so you can set when and what you get and just, there it is, two seconds a day, don't even open the app, swipe it away, but helps keep it top of mind. And so the Brain Bump app works to just give you those gentle reminders, whether it's that daily push or whether it's that just-in-time pull from an ever-growing set of content. Yeah, the app works just absolutely wonderful. I'm looking here really quick on my phone because, like I said, I've been, I've been utilizing this quite a bit. And um, here just, well... Here's the tip that I had from this morning. I actually get two tips uh, at six o'clock in the morning, uh, one on marketing and one uh, that's on communication. And actually, my, my tip this morning uh, came out of the Career Toolkit book, uh, and it's communication is a skill that you can learn. It's like riding a bicycle or typing. If you're willing to work at it, you can rapidly improve the quality of every part of your life from Brian Tracy, and that came not only out of your book, but also came right out of your app. And um, I really appreciate the app. I think it's it's a really wonderful tool. I know it's something that I would have enjoyed um, having, you know, just right there, like you said, you know, leadership tip, boom, right as I walk in the door, um, you know, to start my day or, or something along those lines. It's certainly a wonderful tool. And definitely, folks, you need to check that out. I'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes where you can go and, and click right on that Brain Bump app. So, um, Mark, we're reaching that point in the, in the show where I ask the same question I ask everybody else who joins me here on the show. Um, it's the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. So, Mark, right now, how are you leaning into leadership? My passion is to help people with their personal and professional efficacy. And if I can do that directly through the book or through the Brain Bump app, or if I can do it indirectly by helping other leaders, leaders in our schools, leaders in our companies, use these tools, the book, the app, the resources we mentioned to create those peer learning groups or many of the other free resources, if I can help them be better leaders and upskill the people in their teams, then I consider myself successful. So I am doing everything I can to uplift as many people as I can. I love that. That's an awesome, awesome answer right there. So Mark, for my listeners, just uh, real quick, um, they want to get in touch with you. They want to check out the book. They want to check out the app. Um, I'll put all that stuff in the in the show notes, but for our, our folks who love to just hear it, you know, they're the auditory learners. How do they get in touch with you? How do they find all this great work? I'll give you two websites. The first, thecareertoolkitbook.com. That's the book's website. You can see where to buy it, Amazon elsewhere. You can get in touch with me, read some of the articles I put out. And there's that entire resources page where you have all these free resources, starting with how to create these peer learning groups, completely free download. You can take the credit for it. You can say to your boss, hey, here's a great idea I had. The copyright's open. You can actually cross my name out. And so all of that is at thecareertoolkitbook.com. The second website is brainbumpapp.com. You can go and download it from the stores, and it's completely free. But because it has a space between the words on Google, which is correct, but Apple unfortunately didn't do it that way, it's easiest to go directly to brainbumpapp.com. There you can download the free app. All the content is free. And you can use that as a companion to the Career Toolkit 
or any of the other books, blogs, and other tools on there. Or you can just explore and just say, oh, I've never heard of this before, but I want to check it out and see what great tips it has. So brainbumpapp.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate this. It was a great conversation. And I know you dropped a whole lot of great stuff uh, here throughout the course of the podcast. So thank you for joining me here on Leading Into Leadership. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, I think my favorite part of that conversation with Mark was talking about teaching career skills. I think a lot of you know this about me. Some of you may not. But when I was still an assistant principal, and then this spilled into my principalship as well, I was charged with leading the development of two career academies at the high school where where I was working. And what's interesting is I surrounded myself with some really great people. What we focused on was teaching career skills. And we weren't focusing this on being a program that was just about putting kids into the workforce. I mean, these were programs that were college and career focused. Because let's face it, no matter what we're preparing them for as the next step, we're always preparing them for a career. That's something I think gets lost so often when I talk with people, especially at the high school level. You know, you are preparing kids for a career. I don't care if you're preparing them to go to college or you're preparing them to go right into the workforce. No matter what, you are preparing kids for a career. Now, I'm chasing a squirrel a little bit there, but I get real passionate about making sure that in our schools, we're really driving rigor, relevance, and relationships with our kids. When we do that, that gives us the opportunity to truly get to the skills they're going to need to help them with the mindsets they're going to need and to really set them up for success. And now it's time for a pep talk. Today on the pep talk, I got to tell you this. Man, I'm struggling. Folks, I feel stuck. I've really been having a tough time with my blog posts. The last couple of weeks, I just have had a hard time finding a topic I want to talk about and just feeling motivated about it. Now, yes, I did write a blog post last week about the upcoming release of my book, but that wasn't really where I intended to go. My issue is I'm kind of battling the January doldrums. And I think all of us deal with this. So today, I just want to share this with you. If you're feeling a little stuck in the mud because it's January, because you haven't seen the sunlight in forever, man, I struggled with that when I was working in buildings. You know, you'd leave for school before the sun came up. You'd come home after the sun went down. It was just brutal. I mean, you know, seasonal effectiveness disorder is a real thing, folks. Um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily what it is for me. I think it's just, it's January. It's like that holiday hangover. And sometimes it's tough to shake. So I'll tell you, here are three things I'm going to focus on that I hope will help me move forward. And honestly, that I hope will help you. Um, number one, I want to start embracing some outdoor activities. You know, we love to walk our dogs, but when it's too cold and too snowy, it's, it's tough to get them out there. So I want to come up with something that I can do, even if it's just myself going for a walk. You know, I go to the gym, I get my my workouts in probably five times a week, but I'm not doing much outside. So I think this week I'm going to commit to doing two outdoor walks. Maybe embracing some outdoor time will help get me through these doldrums. And number two, I'm going to use some time to actually get up on the balcony. You know, I talk about the balcony view a lot, right? And as a school leader, you know, I'd go and stand on the balcony and I'd look at, you know, hey, what are the things that are important? My wife challenged me the other day with exactly that same work, but in the work I do now. You know, Darren, you talk about the balcony all the time. Are you getting on the balcony? Maybe you should. And you know what? She's right. So I'm going to really challenge myself, not only in the coming week, but honestly, in the weeks to come to get up on the balcony. Just like I did as a principal, just like I did as a superintendent, I think here in this work, you know, as a content creator, as as a as a coach, a consultant, publisher, all those things I do, speaker, I think I get so stuck in the grind of the work that I forget to go stand on the balcony. So I'm gonna do that. And then the third thing, I want to get back to reading for enjoyment. You know, I had a conversation with a principal earlier this week, and she told me that she hasn't read a book for enjoyment in years. 
And she actually just told me she had just finished the first edition of Road to Awesome, uh, Empower Lee, Change the Game. And she's like, it really actually brought me a lot of enjoyment. You know, if, if there's professional reading that gives you enjoyment, do that. But if all you're doing is being stuck in that professional reading, folks, break out of that cycle. Read a good book. You know, something that is just maybe a guilty pleasure. For me, I love James Patterson. I really do. I just finished the most recent uh, James Patterson book, um, the most recent Alex Cross, and it's phenomenal. I got to do more of that. I I can't just read, you know, that five minutes or so at bedtime. I need to make sure I'm reading for enjoyment at other times of the day. So there you go. That's your pep talk. Take it for what it's worth. Um, Find your way out of the January doldrums, man. Don't worry. Eventually, springtime is coming. And you're here to hear first on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Get out there. Have a road awesome week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.